Welcome to Outside the Vines. This week's episode is a domer's delight. Can you tell? Our guest is going to be former Notre Dame quarterback and 12-year NFL vet Rick Meyer. Yeah, we'll talk about college football and his career there, as well as his NFL time, which led him into acquiring his passion for wine. And no Notre Dame story would be complete without an anecdote or two about his legendary coach, Lou Holtz. All of that is going to happen while we enjoy this gem, his Mirror 2016 Napa Valley Cab from Howell Mountain. This is a big wine with a tremendous finish, 94 points from wine enthusiast, and it will be rated by our Parker. That's right. Glenn Parker will have his next level analysis of the wine. And the real challenge is going to be, can a U of A great really handle drinking a wine from a Notre Dame quarterback? Well, find out. Pour yourself a glass and join us for the love of wine and the thirst for sports. This is Outside the Vines. All right, so Rick, we set this up by talking about these uh, these great threads of your life. We've had three episodes of Outside the Vines, and you're the third quarterback to be on. How in the heck has this happened? And quarterbacks and the threat of you and Bledsoe being the first two players chosen in the 93 draft and ending up together in the wine business is, who? first of all, who dragged whom into it? I think it was a tie. I mean, we, we both were kind of caught at the same time by the by the bug um we we just had a lot of things in common and, and communicated a lot of ways but but wine wasn't right in the first few years it kind of came later on as we grew up and and matured and and got past a few of the, the early you know early 20s things but I, I mean you know we we talked about doing stuff together and then we've compared notes all the way through but uh, I, I think you're talking about Damon would be the yeah. third guy. Uh, Danny was going to be a part of the thing we were talking years ago about. But, yeah, we, it's just been fun to bounce stuff off people who understand kind of our perspective back and forth. And I was the first one. I have 05 vintage, so if, there, if there's a race to the finish line, I'm taking that. Well, well, we have, well we've had three quarterbacks, but we have – our Parker, and you're gonna, we're going to find out shortly because our Parker is a tasting expert, and here's Glenn representing the old line. So, Glenn, come on, get in here and swing on your behalf. It's easy, right? You know, the prep. We both have to prep a lot for games. O line, quarterbacks. There's a ton of prep goes in. It's just when it comes to owning wineries, the O linemen aren't quite on the economic scale that quarterbacks are. So we get into the other side. We get into the drinking and the critiquing of the wine and working at wineries uh, where we have an employer who generally was a quarterback at some time. So it never changes. Our relationship with the quarterback from high school on up is always the same. We are subservient to him, and uh, <laughs> we get to enjoy the fruits of the labor. All right. So, so Rick, you grew up right in the shadows of Notre Dame. You're obviously the most famous winemaker to come out of Goshen, okay, I assume. I'm not sure if you're the only, but you're definitely the most famous, right? I don't know of any others, yeah, yeah. so that's that's pretty simple. Who drank that? I mean, who put a glass of wine in your hand the first time and said, hey, you got to try this? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't in Goshen. It wasn't in South Bend. I mean, it was later when I was in Seattle. We spent a lot of time at uh, the Metropolitan Grill, like – I'm sure Glenn knows, and 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 we we didn't really do a lot of wine, but it was sort of like a you know the big steakhouse right after a lot of those home games uh, had some wine, but it was it was a few years later for me. I was probably down in San Diego by then in my mid twenties, later twenties, uh, until I appreciated wine. I'd, I'd been offered wine and I liked it, but until my wife was cooking the way she was, and we were traveling and living in all these different places. Um, I didn't really understand it or appreciate it or pay attention to it. And then once I did, I, it, it just, it just, you know, sunk its teeth in me. And I, and I got crazy about just reading and learning and studying. And, and, uh, and then I wind up with the Raiders in training camp in Napa Valley for a couple seasons in a row. And it was over. That was, that was the, you know, that was it for me. And, and, you know, several years after that, when I retired, I, I wound up going back to some of those people I met in those years and, found a project, something we can handle and get started uh, and turn into something fun. You know, I, I think that 
almost everybody comes to wine kind of the same time in their life if you're not one of the blessed ones who's born into it. And I, I think you're, you you talk about sinking your teeth into it, but in many ways, doesn't it sink its teeth into you? Isn't it kind of like there's this rabbit hole that you know, maybe you're eating some good food and you realize that wine just went with that food so much better than anything else I ever had. And then you start getting this this thirst to just go out and really start digging in. And I, I think you... I. I call it the rabbit hole. It sinks its teeth into you, but the way you put it is that kind of how it, I mean, when you talk about it, it, it just, you just get so curious. There's just so much and you can keep going. It's endless. I mean, it's completely, you know, I mean, I don't feel any different now, 13 years in the business. I mean, it's the more, you know, the more you feel like you need to learn. Um, and there's so many different tactics and techniques and strategies and oak and all, a lot of, you know, we don't really do the farming part ourselves. I mean, I'm not, you know, we're custom crush and, and we're more about, you know, the best stuff we can start with and having a great winemaking team and, and marketing and, and try to, you know, do that. But, um, man, it's like I, I, I was studied regions. I, I, we got all the way to port. Like I, I figured out, like I was not an expert, but I knew quite a bit about vintage port at, the, at, at one point because uh, Drew and I were trading wine and trying to one up each other all the time. And we finally got to where I knew we had all the Italian stuff. I knew we'd been through Bordeaux. We'd been through the Australian Shiraz kind of phase. We've done the Zinfandel phase, well, obviously the Cabernets and, and Walla Walla and Napa the Pinot phase, we, we, we went through all those things. All, and I go, I know he doesn't have port, so I'm going to blow his mind and send him two cases of vintage port, which I bet he still has a bunch of. Uh, he may not know where it is, but we, we, we just, you know, the, the, the information is endless, and I was just a sponge. And I just I loved reading and learning. Uh, the critics are kind of one of those ways to, to get the information, and we didn't want to rely too much on scores. But it's always cool to say you had a hundred point wine, you know, a sip of this or a sip of that. So, yeah, I, I was, you know, super into it right away and stayed that way a long time and then decided to do our own thing. Yeah. That, that's fascinating. The Napa hook, which is the other thing we mentioned leading into the episode. I'm surprised because when when I read that about you, Rick, I immediately thought, wow, I'm surprised that didn't happen more often because the Raiders <laughs> were in decades an institution in Napa, right? I mean, did you have did yeah. you have winemakers come hanging around practice? Not really, um, a little bit. Uh, one of my favorites and my one of my first, you know, friends in the business is a guy named Jeff Smith at Hourglass, mm -hmm. and Jeff's just a gigantic Raider fan. And he he's you know he was the guy I was introduced to through friends at Trevigne back in those days. Karen Williams was at that uh, Cantonetta and that little retail shop. And my wife and I, when we went the first time in 98, 90, late 97 or 98, um, you know, she said, try this hourglass. It's it's a new project. It's small. Um, so he, he was a guy who actually was interested in football, knew his wine, had family kind of business and, and, and was kind of beginning to, to, to break through with hourglass stuff. But, you know, since then, they've built this really, really cool property and Sadly, they got affected pretty hard by the fires, you know, this last go around in 2020. But, um, th yeah, we, you know, the Raiders, we, we were only there for three weeks maybe in, in, for training camp those years. But any chance I got with off time, I was down at a real restaurant. I wasn't doing room service like the other guys. <laughs> You know, I, um, Rick, for 96, 97, in that range, all the way until I retired, I actually worked my off seasons anywhere from a couple weeks to a month or better at Robert Vandali and tours and tastings down in the room. Um, their general manager at the time, who's now a, a kind of emeritus is a huge Raider fan. And he, and that's kind of how I got involved is that very thing. Uh, the amount of Napa Valley vintners, farmers, field workers that are absolutely complete friends of the, of the Raiders is mind boggling up there. And probably all due to the fact that camp has been there for so many years. Yeah, no, it was really cool. Um, it was a business trip for us, of course. But um, I think, that, you know, that community took that team on and it was 50 miles away anyway. It was either there were Niner. There's definitely a Niner thing, too, with with Napa. I don't know. It's kind of like Cubs, White Sox or Mets, Yankees, I suppose. But um, the Raiders spent more time there, it felt like. And, and, and I don't know, the the fan base, it just made sense. 
uh, Raider crew isn't as quite as fancy as maybe some of the Niner years and in, in the the way the stadiums operate a little bit. But um, we were embraced. It, it was there was a great energy around practice. A lot of people wanted to come. I wouldn't say it was the you know it wasn't the top winemakers sitting in the stands watching practice, but it might have been. I, it was some there were chefs and guys that popped in once in a while. Uh, but we were we were working, and then when we had some time off, we 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 knew where the really good yeah. food well, wine was. Not to mention, we're conscious, and that's where you know yeah. that's that's the yes, <laughs> that's the one. Plenty, plenty. Yeah, oh yeah, you got to have a beer sometimes it's too, fun, right? Yeah. It's funny. I've never heard of Al Davis with wine. That's what. That's the other thing I started wondering. Is that that's one <laughs> connection I never made. Yeah. Well, Mr. Davis was. He was all business, and it yeah. wasn't uh, it wasn't about the location. It didn't matter where we were, but uh, yeah, I, I I was I was lucky. I mean, I got there and we voted to the Super Bowl. Yeah. I mean, it's my tenth year. I'm not playing. Rich Gannon was my roommate in the, in the hotel there at the Marriott, and he he thinks he knows quite a bit about wine, and he kind of might, but <laughs> really, he he knew the bare bones, and and I supported that, and and we collected. We had piles of boxes in, in our room. And when we left to drive back, we had all this stuff to take back. And, uh, yeah, it was it was just fun to have more than like a vacation kind of trip there or two or three days. Like when you actually spend two, three weeks somewhere, it's a little different. Mm -hmm. And it never got old to me. I just said this just keeps getting better and better. Does Rich know enough to be on your mailing list? Yeah, he well, yeah. he's. He doesn't. He, I, he probably took the old lineman to you know many meals, but uh, yeah, he's he's not our greatest customer, I'll say, but I know he likes the wine. Well, he also likes his classic cars, so you know he's got his, he's yeah. got his expensive hobbies to go with it. So not I can understand. Yeah. So, you know, what about football? Would you say whether it be from a young age or as a professional? What about football? Do you think lends itself to so many? quarterbacks, ex-players that get involved in the wine business. What about those two things, Jives? You know, it's, it's a good question. And now it's a lot of other sports. I mean, it's different. It's changed a lot in 10 years um, with a lot of the NBA guys. And, and it used to be just golf and race car stuff. And now I, I think it's just competition. I don't know. I mean, Drew and I are really good buddies and Damon's a pal too. I mean, it's just fun to compete. We're not really, we're trying to help each other more than anything else, but um we always we want to do more and we want to achieve whatever we can. I think we're all competitors. Um, I don't think that's unique to quarterbacks exactly, but there's definitely something there. I don't know. I, I feel like the quarterback of this wine team, and I'm not the winemaker and I'll never pretend to be, but somebody's got to kind of coordinate how it goes and the communication. And I'm big on communication and you know, to me, it's running a business. I had no experience in either thing. I, I knew wine as a consumer. I'm a competitive person, but I'm running a business that's, you know, way beyond my my education. But I got caught up pretty quick, and luckily had a good team around me. And I don't know. I, I mean, I'm the face of our brand. I don't want to have to do everything. Uh, so there, it feels like there's a lot of similarities with playing the position, but. You, you kind of take a beating too, you know, when, when things aren't quite as, you know, quite the way you want them. But um, we've had so many good days and, and it's fun to solve problems and fix things. We had some stuff today, shipping. I mean, there's a lot of little things that go into getting this right. Uh, customer service and just compliance and, and getting wine across the country with temperature and everything. It's they're, they're, Those are the things I didn't think about before we got in. And it's it's kind of fun to learn on the fly and figure it out. And then you gain experience and, you know, do better the next time. And, and Rick, something else that no one would have thought of, I certainly couldn't have his fires. You touched on it. I mean, yeah. And, oh, and yeah. sadly, all of us who live in Northern California are, are going to live with this, I think, as a permanent feature, um, most prominently in your area. How have, do you have any experience? Has there been any close calls in for mirror wine with well, the fires? <laughs> Way too many of our friends went through a lot worse than 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 us. We we don't own property. Um, we source fruit. We've you know work with the farming, um, but we don't have a twenty twenty vintage for anything red. I mean, with the whites were fine, like every like pretty much everyone else. I mean, that's just what happened. So. Um, you kind of had to just go with the flow. Unfortunately, it was four years in a row. 2020 was the worst. 
Um, we, we, we thought maybe around this time last year, the worst, of, the worst of it was a pandemic, but it was not even close. The fire, the fires were way worse. So that was a one, two punch that hopefully we'll never have to live through again. Um, but you know, we're small, we're, we're kind of nimble enough. I've got a good team, Kirk Vengi making everything. He's, he's got great relationships. We, you know, I'm sure there's legal battles and stuff with growers and, you know, a lot of the wineries, but we don't have any lingering effects. I just pray for a clean 21 vintage, uh, and harvest. We're due for a good one, um, weather wise. And, and thankfully, I mean, 2020 was the worst with the, with the Cabernet and the stuff late, but we've always had good, I mean, with our 17s and 18s and 19s, everything else has been fine, even though we're dodging bullets and getting through it kind of the hard way. Um, 2020 was just too much. It was just, it just, we couldn't overcome that. So recapping so far, you know, the weather and so what you've done in the field so far through 21, where, where do you think you are? How's it look? Everybody's excited. I mean, it's very promising. Um, obviously things can change quickly, but, um, um, you know, it gets hot in Napa and, and, you know, we're dealing with some spikes and stuff and, you just hope we don't, you know, the, the winds and the power lines and those those are the things that, like, hopefully we're learning from, you know, killing the power and which is tough on the wineries with needing generators and stuff to keep things cool and everything. But uh, I think we're a little more prepared if something sparks up somewhere. But I, you know, I, it, it, once it's once it's going, it's it's a it's a tough thing to corral. But um, the, the 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 weather's been fine. I mean, in California in general, we could always use more rain. I mean, we could use some some water, but um, so far so good. I know it's you know middle of May, but it, it, you know it could it could be an early harvest again. But um, I just I just hope we get a, a an easier one than we've had the last three four years. What what makes Howell Mountain special? Elevation, you know. I mean. There's a lot of different mountain fruit, but it's and we love the stuff on the floor as well. But 2,000 feet almost mm -hmm. is how a mountain and Chimarosa. Uh, it, it's just like these microclimates that that have their own kind of personalities and their own you know style year after year. It's just had consistency with it's it's it, it was closer to the fires. Uh, it, it got affected a little bit quicker than some of the other things, but it kind of everything got hurt last year. So. Um, yeah, we've been, we've been ecstatic. We started in 09 in Chimarosa. So to have like a single vineyard, hundred percent cab, hundred percent new French Oak, 29 month, you know, aged beauty in a small production next to our really flagship Cabernet. That's a blend of multiple cab sources. It's just kind of fun to have two different things. Cause at the beginning we started with just one wine and now we've got five. And those two cabs are, are great complements to each other, and but different. If you have to pick out a thing about Howl Mountain, a characteristic of, of the grapes, particularly in Chimarosa, what would you say is going to be a characteristic of any wine, for the most part, that comes out of that vineyard? You know, um, I would say year after year after year, structure, it, it feels like it's always got this balance, but it's 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 aging now that we have some years of proof. I mean, it's aging gracefully. It, it's it's got power. There's tannins that are different because of the you know the the, the mountain fruit, I guess, in general. But um, it, it's it's just got this big boy wine, but balance to it. Um, I would say our other cab is more finesse. It's not. It's not a sissy, but it's got a different kind of finesse to it. It's very approachable right away. Um, we, you know, all the way back to 09, the, the, the Howell Mountains have just gotten better. So it's exciting to open these young, not knowing what to expect, like hope, hoping like you're maybe a little too early, but it's like, damn, it's actually, give it a little air. It's ready. It, you know, this is this is for, you know, a lot of people with food and stuff. This is this is fine, but it's going to age and it's going to change. Um, they're not fizzling out. I mean, there's just a lot of oomph. I mean, there's some big, big, you know, guys in, in, in Howell Mountain. We don't struck, we don't build it like all the way. You got to wait 10 years to try it. Um, and I'm not going to mention any names, but it, it, it's got, I don't know. It's just got 
some muscle to it, and it just it's it's fun. We're proud to pull it out. It's not inexpensive, but it's not it's not crazy by any stretch of the imagination. So it's kind of the perfect. You know, big steak, big steakhouse kind of, you know, big boy wine. I, I love I'm learning listening to you. And I've I have another person I learned about the mountain fruit. And I don't know if you've been on Diamond Mountain at all, but Tom Seaver, who sadly we lost, uh, You're right. became a friend. And Tom was adamant. I mean, he pl he bought on the side of Diamond Mountain because he believed in the mountain fruit and his wine. Yeah. Hopefully will still be I think his family is going to carry on making his wine, which is grown on his property, but he swore by what you just said, Rick, the mountain fruit is different. Well, and they're small, they're just small areas. You know, there's, they're not, there's not a lot of producers in those, you know, geographical spots. And it's, there's just a loyalty. I think people are like, whether it's, you know, Howell Mountain or Diamond Mountain or in, anything else, um, once you, like one of them, you kind of want to try a few of the other ones. And, and a lot of times, I mean, it's not the most convenient place to get to some, in some cases, right? There's these windy roads and right. stuff, and, and it's a little, little bit of distance, but um, I, I'm just a big fan of like anybody can go to certain places. You got to go out of your way a little bit and find these little gems that are tucked away. And, and that's, that's what the mountain places I think offer you, you know, it's a little bit off the beaten path. And it, it's it's got character. That's 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 huge to me. Well, I I'm like Adam. I of course um, I had to open mine early. I was having a big chunk of steak for dinner, a big chunk of beef, I should say, and and so I did open mine earlier. And I, so much of what you say is absolutely correct. Uh, this is not a cocktail one. And, and I say that as a flattering, to, this is a wine that five years right now on it, or almost it's, it's, you, you're correct. There's structure there, but there is fruit. This thing is soft. This thing's approachable and soft right now. And I don't think it's going anywhere for at least 10, 15. I mean, you're going to be 10, 15 years easily with this thing. It, it, the, the fruit that comes through, um, it's that kind of that mature fruit that, that, that little bit some people call it cooked fruit um it's there you've got you've got every element of that of the structure and the flavor profile of a howl mountain you know there is that tannic kind of um i guess some people call it saddle some people call it you know uh, tobacco it's in that family to go with that yeah. fruit of that still tastes round and fruity but yet has a little bit of that cooked characteristic in it um and i tell you i <laughs> i've enjoyed it very much as i've been sitting here when i was having my dinner and waiting for it and i did let it air for a bit and um it's gotten better in the last half hour as it's been sitting and just kind of softening up and, and ripening on its own it's this is i would say bravo nice nicely done on, uh, from my end yeah well, thanks. I, you know, it means that means a lot to me because I've you don't know this, but I I know how much or I've I've read about you a little bit too, and I know how much you studied and stuff. I mean, years ago when when I, I think it was in Spectator, yes. uh, and I kind of wondered how does an old lineman get the you know get the gig and <laughs> no, but. No, we like food, I, I, I want we like good food. <laughs> I think like my biggest fear with this entire project was like it can't be like some goofy sports guy wine. This is a real wine, and I want wine people to acknowledge or appreciate it or discover it without seeing like the theatrics behind it or some sort of any you know smoke and mirrors. It's like it's actually its own thing, and it's. I think it's underpriced. I'm, I'm ner I don't like raising prices, um, but we, we've put a lot of effort into this thing, and it performs, and it's beautiful, and we're, we're proud of it. And it's, and so I, I like the people's opinions who haven't had it before and don't maybe know what to expect and go, man. The, the thing I hear all the time is, "Wow, it's actually good." <laughs> well, <laughs> why are we doing this? And of course, yeah, we, we're going to make a good wine. Oh, goodness. Well, I love that. That's why, and Rick, that's why we call him our Parker, because he is a very, and it's taught me a lot, partnering with Glenn through the years. I've learned a lot, too, about this. Hey, um, you, I, I was fascinated earlier in our conversation. You said phase. You mentioned a couple of phases. And obviously, cabs is a staple. I noticed this is 100% cab. Have you, have you guys ever blended anything into your cabs? We have. Um... We dabble. We haven't for a little while, but we're, we have some uh, Cab Franc coming for 21. Mm -hmm. And we're going to use it to blend a little, and we're going to do a little barrel on the side for fun. 
we did a, a Petit Verdot 13 that was bar barrel aged like 48 months, I think, um, that we we did 50 cases of two or three years ago by the time we got it bottled. So I, I like the one-offs. Um, this has always been 100% cab. The other cab has had Malbec, uh, you know, a percent or two. And the blending thing is where I get involved. And I'm uh, like Kirk's great winemaking. That's why we have him. I, I he he's polite about including my you know opinion on certain things. But I I get involved in the blending trials because I I think it's fascinating to get the beakers out and we're, we're measuring percent like you know tiny differences between this and that. And they're totally noticeable, and it's fascinating. Um, so, at the end, you know, we want to use what we have, but we want to make sense of like where it goes and how do we how do we kind of think ahead for the next year and what what did this vineyard do that maybe we should think about them long term or look for something else, um, including adding Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay and even a rosé from Pinot Noir that I never would have thought was would you know be something that we would spend as much time on as we do, but it's, it's a huge compliment to the lineup. So, I, you know, the, the white wine phase came really late for me, but I have so much appreciation for that because my wife likes Rosé more than she likes Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc. And it's just, it's just an easy start to, you know, the, yeah. the, the smells are starting to happen in the kitchen. I'm like, okay, what are we going to, you can't just open the Howl Mountain, right? You gotta, you gotta start with something a little bit, a little bit simpler. So I'm a sucker for the food. I mean, I just love the pairings. I'm a big believer in, in food and wine kind of go together. And I, a lot of people kind of disagree, but I, I you know, I, 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 I like it cause I think it's challenging and I think it's rewarding when you get it right. Uh, and I'm not a picky eater. I'll eat anything. So there aren't many combinations that I'll reject, but when you get it right, you know it. And, you know, I've had a lot of phases and I, one I haven't gotten yet that is probably coming is cooking. I, I have, I've been spoiled for so long because Stephanie's so good at that. Um, with our three boys, I mean, big eaters, I just stay out of the way. I mean, the groceries, I help with the groceries, but man, I like the grill, but everything else is, is beyond I'm me. I'm going to tell you right now, butterfly leg of lamb. Okay. Butterfly leg. What do you think, Glenn? With with, I, with a little hot, with a little Howl Mountain cab here, what do you think? I like anything in the in the red meat family. I totally agree. I think I would have a um, I'd have a any type of steak that has a little bit of fat in it is going to go great with this because those tannins are going to yep. really cut through that and be be nice. And uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm 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 so happy, Rick. And if I had to ask you, what would your perfect food be with this wine? And thank you for saying about food and wine, because people ask me, what's your favorite wine? I go, what am I eating? That's my first yeah. question back. What am I eating? And I'll tell you what my favorite wine is. I got beat up recently from, a, like, harassed a little bit from a winemaking buddy who um, who's very opinionated. I'm not going to mention his name <laughs> because you probably know him. But he's, like, opposite. He's like, I don't care if you're eating fish or steaks or whatever. I mean, good wines, good wine, good food. I can do that. Like I can stomach that. I'm I'm good, but not everybody. That's not that interesting. I think it's cool when you can go. You know, I'm not into the four hour fancy dinners either. But sometimes, like I'm a red meat guy. We do a lot of tri tip here. It's a crowd pleaser in the in the we you know t not teenagers anymore. These guys are twenty and twenty two years old and a um, couple hundred pound like big eaters. I mean, we we crush these tri tips, and this is a this is so easy with that. It's just, it's, it's not comfort food, but everybody's comfortable. Yeah. What? I, so you mentioned rosé of Pinot, which is what I was talking to Adam before we started. That, I can't tell you how many wineries I've seen just in the last month that have thrown rosé of Pinot out there. Is that another phase we're going to enter? Um, yeah, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you something that explains why we did it. And I would imagine it's similar to some of these other producers. Um we had no plan on making Pinot uh, Rosé 2020, but with the fire situation, Kirk said they're not going to let the Pinot hang. So if we want to pull four or five tons, make a bunch of Rosé, we can do that. If we want to make Pinot Noir, I don't, I don't know. The, the smoke's a you know delicate thing, and it's becoming very day to day. So we pulled the trigger and decided to do what we did. 
we had made Pinot in the past, or uh, sorry, uh, Rosé in the past, but it wasn't the same vineyard. It wasn't the same kind of timing. So I'm learning more about Rosé all the time. I, I didn't think I needed it in my life, but I actually do. It's it's kind of fun. It, it, you know, so many people are open to it. They're willing to try it. And there's a lot of different styles and a ton of ways to do it. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, it's fast. That's the, that is kind of the phase I'm in right now. Actually, this time of year, especially because we just released it and people are ordering and getting it and sending us pictures and saying, man, this is great. Nice. And so, yeah, that's fun. I mean, with the, with the weather changing, that's the kind of wine, you know, you do. And that's before perfect. you start. Rick, that's absolutely perfect. Because, you know, for me, that phase came when I moved to Tucson 20 something years ago. And, you know, let's face yeah. it, you're, you're sitting here and it's, yeah, it's not officially summer anymore, but it's still 95 degrees. It's comfortable, but you really don't want to open a bottle of red and sit outside while you're grilling something. And those, no. um, before a lot of the American producers, of course, you know, uh, Provence, there's a, there's a ton of them. Uh, and, and they're so, they, they're so rounded and structured and, you know, there's, there's, everybody expects them to have some giant mass of residual sugar and they don't, that they kind of blow a lot of people away when they have them for the first time out by the pool or around the outside table. And I, I mean, to me, I'm so I'm happy to hear that you're going to do it. I love the fact more California producers are getting on board because it, still living in Tucson, it, it's rosé time. It really is. We're hot here now, and yeah. it's time to break them out. They're chilled, they're nice, and they're they're a wonderful wine. Yeah. Oh, it's a crowd pleaser, and and people that are intimidated a little bit by wine, like they think you know Bordeaux or big red wine is wine. Rosé's wine, and it's. It's not a huge commitment. I mean, it's not as it's not expensive. It's you chill it. It's it's comfortable. It's it's there's no huge commitment. It, I, everything about it makes sense. I mean, then you get into the winter months in certain places, and maybe you don't go through so much. Yeah. You know, it changes. But for now, like that that we're kind of it's like pairing it up with food. We're pairing it up with the weather a little bit too, right? right? Absolutely. And what you're doing in that weather? That's you know you're outside. You're going to be outside. You're going to be. It's not the time for a, a, a room temperature red. It's the time for something that's refreshing and nice. So I'm excited to see what you come out with and give it a shot. We'll get you some because it's. Um, I think all you guys have is the Howl Mountain. I mean, there's there's we have five wines, so they all have a different personality. They have a different place in the in the lineup, but. They're, you know, they're, they're siblings and they're all good. How much during the process of building a, a blend, or unless it's, you know, or a barrel blend, how much in that process you evolved? How much input do you do you have or do you seek, I should say, is even better when it comes to deciding this is what we're going to make? The, the, that's the greatest question, seek. Like, I, I, I want to let the – like, when you, when you have a, a winemaker, it's kind of like you're – your artist you know it took for me to slow him down is crazy like he he knows so much more than i'll ever understand with some of the relationships and some of the timing and some of the fruit sources and history and techniques and barrels and sometimes great deals or let's hurry up and make a decision before somebody else takes what we want i mean there's so many things that go into it i am included um politely by him for blending of the Cabernets um, all the time. I'm 500 miles away, so I'm not always there. Uh, I, I go out of my way to do those things because I want to be involved. And I want to educate myself in a way that I can't reading, you know, like I did years ago, just about different producers in different regions. So it's been a fascinating thing, and I try to include other people on our team so they can, when they have to, you know, show the wines, they can, they can say, hey, I was at the blending and this is this is why we you know we chose this you know combination or these percentages and um, it's not overly sophisticated but I I, I want to be involved in that but I don't want to like kind of act like I know or f do more than Kirk because Kirk Kirk really has the final say he just wants me to bless it and 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 we've had an unbelievable relationship that way so far so good I mean it's not it, it's uh, I wouldn't do it any other way. I mean, if I wanted to become a winemaker, I need to move and I need to do it every day. And that's just not happening. So it's fun to have the role that I do. And I and I care about w where the wine is, why, and like who's going to get it, uh, who, who gets the crack at it first. 
you know, those types of things more than some of the little nuances of 3%, 4%, why, you know, we'll always find a way to use what we have. And, and even the little tiny little runs, you know, little one-offs, those are cool. If, if, you, if, if you need to unload a little bit, fine. Like I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. And, you know, I'm open to everything. I mean, we've, we've had, I mean, we do what we've really cut back on. I would say over the years is the 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 different sizes of bottles. Like we we had three seventy fives, seven fifties, magnums, threes, and sixes because we thought we needed to. And then we're like, wait a minute! Like the, the world doesn't understand three seventy fives. Like the rest, some restaurants do, or you just don't. So let's just make our life simpler. And so I've made those kind of executive decisions on you know, how we want to handle the inventory and, and how we're going to present this. But I've recently uh, got one of these little guys for the first time. And I, I've had no problem with my friends and family, like, like finishing a bottle of wine, but it's kind of fun to dip into m more things in a, in a, in the same day. And um, that's how, that's how this got poured tonight. Same thing. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a 750 yeah. guy. Magnums are cool. I have so many magnums and we never open them. So, you know, the, 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 all the three liters and six liters go to charity things, which is why we're making them, but we're making fewer because it, it's just less to, to try to, you know, sell to the mailing list or people who just, they have no need for certain, you know, clumsy bottles. But um, yeah, I, 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 you know, my decisions aren't the tiny little things about the wine, uh, I have an opinion, and Kirk respects that, and we usually think the same way. Uh, we just decided to put a little oak on the Sauvignon Blanc that we're getting from Kick Ranch in 21. We're switching vineyards, and it's always been stainless, and it's always been a different place. But we're gonna we got a couple barrels, and that's that's like a big decision, you know. That's a, that's a big deal, uh, but it's fun to be a part of that conversation. All right, let's pivot here as we as we start to wrap. We need some football. Now, you, you were a three-year starter at Notre Dame, and as tagged at the beginning of this, either, uh, you know, with a ton of talent. I mean, you, your teams were loaded, and you had Lou Holtz. We need a Lou Holtz story. Oh gosh, he's. <clears throat> what I loved about Lou was when he would when he would get out there and he would he would intention because Lou is very smart as Rick knows he knew exactly what he was saying and we'd talk about how much he respected the University of Purdue and he did that <laughs> he knew exactly what he was doing because it's Purdue University for those who may not know yeah. but he would say the University of Purdue and he would very very smart <laughs> yeah it's just it's so funny I spent so much time with him in a way that the other guys in my class and the classes around me didn't because we were in those little huddles where either figure it out in a timeout or you don't most times we did but occasionally you know it just doesn't work out and i got called things that i can't repeat but i don't i would i would never do it differently it was just it was such a rush um I, my favorite there's so many stories and i'll keep it short we tied michigan and, and you know the, the game's changed so much like shotgun and overtime and there's just different rules and different things uh the, the field turf how we played on grass and there was like no replay and you know it was stone ages i guess when you might if you ask my boys but we tie we tie michigan and that felt like the like so weird to to walk off the field a rival team like what 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 was that like that that was awful so then we get in the situation my senior year at the end of the game against penn state we're going down to score. To, we're down one. Could we? Do we want to tie? We want to kick an extra point or, or go for two. And, and this is, turns out to be my favorite game because of the way it worked out. But before we scored the touchdown to get within one, I said, "Be ready for two touchdowns because we are never going to kick an extra point against <laughs> these guys." And he's like, "I'm with you." There's no. I mean, and that was just us. Like, there's just three of us in this little huddle. And I said, "Coach." There's no way we're tying. We we we've been through that, and that that just didn't that didn't sit well. So let's score, and then we got to score again. So let's be thinking ahead a little bit, and you know, it worked out, and it was dramatic, and, and I got 
pretty fortunate that my running backs made all the catches necessary to 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 secure that thing. But um, man, I I appreciated the, like those little intimate kind of quick situations where you could be nervous or stunned or whatever. Or I was comfortable enough with him as a senior and a captain and all these years of playing that I said, don't even think about you know, protecting something we're, we're, this is all or nothing. And, and he was, he didn't hesitate. And I, I love him for that. Cause it worked. And uh, we all know we made the right decision on the plot. Like every Joe Marino has a blue hole story, but they all have an impersonation. Do you have one for us? <laughs> Not no, going to do it. <laughs> no, I don't. Got so many guys do. Andy Hex got the best. I think that I've ever heard. There, there's, there's so many guys. Um, yeah. I mean, he, it, it has to get a lot darker for me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> or get to get to the bottom of the bottle. Um, yeah. The other thing I remember vividly, Rick, the first year you started, Notre Dame and Miami had a sequence of incredibly emotional games. And this was 1990 was your first year starting. And you threw a pass to one of your running backs, Rodney Culver, ended up yeah. scoring to win the game. And it was the most emotional, incredible college football atmosphere I think I've ever been there for. Notre Dame students were wearing t-shirts that on the back said F Miami. <laughs> and I was literally in the athletic department office the following week when the priest came in and said, series is off. Because they saw the kids wearing the, and said, this is what, the, if this is what the series does to our students, we're done. And they didn't play. It was probably about 20 plus years before the two schools played again. So you were a part of that memorable win. Yeah, there were so many things in those few games. Um, that was a series that has a life of its own, and it wasn't like we played 30 right. years. I mean, we've got way more history with a lot of other places. But I have – I'll just leave it at this. With that, I, I, my youngest son is being recruited, and I said, I got two vetoes, Miami, USC. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> Oh gosh. Well, Glenn, I think we've uh I think your your tasting and your dissection of the uh, Howell Mountain was perfect tonight. It's a wonderful uh, wonderful toast for us. Well, thank you. It's it's gone incredible and and Rick, uh here's the better days ahead and and the things you've put out let the uh it's an old one, I'll just change it. And here's to you and may the uh may the worst vintages always be behind you and always getting better to come. So, here's to you. Amen. Here's, thank here's you. to Mirror Wine, Rick. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Thanks, guys. Yeah. And we, uh, we're this is our third app, and we have been so thrilled to have had some marvelous guests and uh, so three top tier quarterbacks and a pretty good major league shortstop with us. We're not going to have an app dropping because of Memorial Day, so stay with us. It'll be a week after when we'll uh, we'll come back with our next. But uh, we're not giving up. Adam Gordon will not let us. So thanks to Rick and thanks for all of you for hanging with us outside the vines.